I want to begin by reminding you of, of two things, two very important things, because I want to unfold the implications of these two things. The first is that we came this close to stopping Brexit towards the end of last year, this close. If the opposition parties had not agreed to a general election, we would very probably have had another referendum by now, and this whole chaos would have been over and done with. But unfortunately, Labour and, and Lib Dems agreed to, to an election. And that leads to my second point. If you look at the general election of December last year, you see that the 80 seat majority won by the Conservative Party was shock us into thinking uh, about what we're to do with our constitutional and political arrangements. It is just simply not acceptable that uh, the uh, government should have a 100% control of the levers of power in our country on the basis of less than 29% of the electorate. Reform of our electoral system, quite independently of any other consideration, is urgent. But it is also the case that if our electoral system were reformed and we had a system of proportional representation, probably a single transferable vote, no system is perfect, but that is one of the better versions. And we had a, a, a parliament that reflected therefore the greater diversity of opinion and interests uh, in the country, it is extremely likely that that parliament would put the question uh, back to the people as to whether they want to stay outside the EU. There does seem to me to be a, a, a possible path. It may look like a very difficult path and a very unlikely one at the moment, but there is a possible path to being back in the EU sometime in the next five to 10 years. And that path is, we get electoral reform, and I'm going to talk about how we might achieve that, and we uh, get the, the reformed parliament to offer us another say on whether we want to return to membership of the EU. And I'm very confident, very confident indeed, on the figures, on the demographics, that that would be a positive answer. So let me just go back to the point I started with, the point about the um, just being so close to stopping Brexit towards the end of last year. Again, have a look at the, the figures uh, in the general election. 43% people voting for the Conservative Party, but 53% voting for parties that were either committed to remaining in the EU or were committed to having another referendum. So the majority of people who voted in the, uh, actually cast votes in the general election last December, uh, were casting votes for having another say on membership of the EU. And that figure, that proportion has grown. On Monday of this week, uh, a polling data was published showing that 57% of the electorate want to be in the EU and 35% of the electorate think that uh, we, we should be out. Some of whom, by the way, will be those who say, oh, well, it's happened, can't go back now, it's all too late, so we might as well accept it and try to do the best that we can. And this, of course, relates to a point I want to revert to later, which is a point about deal or, or no deal, what kind of deal and, and so on, because that's very germane. If we had a deal that was very, very close to single market and uh, customs union membership, then what, what are called the acquis, that is the conditions for membership, will be preserved uh, over the next few years while we're working to get back into the EU, and that would be a good thing. On the other hand, if we don't get a deal, we crash out on world uh, trade organization terms and the economic impact is extremely serious and people are even more dissatisfied with the situation. That could uh, galvanize people into thinking we've really made an historic mistake that, that, that we have to correct. So uh, th there are gains and losses uh, either way. But in the general election, we, we had those numbers. I really think it's important to remember two things. The first is that there has never, since June 2016 itself, ever been more than 37% of the total electorate in this country that is uh, that has wanted to leave the EU. That was the percentage of the electorate that voted to leave back in 2016, and it has never been higher than that. In fact, uh, the uh, people who voted for the Conservative Party 
for the Brexit party and UKIP in December, and, and they total about 47% of the electorate, would include a considerable number of people voting Conservative um, who don't want to leave the EU, but who even more didn't want to have Jeremy Corbyn as, as uh, Prime Minister. And so uh, the, the figures are very much on the side of those of us who are pro-EU and who would like to work to get back into the EU. Because I think there is a consistent majority and a growing majority. And this is why it's so important that we shouldn't say, well, it's all over now, it's all too late, we're stuck with it, we're not going to be able to get another say for another generation and so on. You know, it used to be the case that people thought you could only have a referendum once in a generation. Well, politics has changed, the world has changed, the uh, dysfunctionality of our constitutional arrangements in this country, and in particular, the electoral arrangements in this country, which have been so, so uh, um, hacked, really. I mean, when you think about what, what has happened, I may remind you, and I'm sure I said this to you, um, some of you before, when visiting Cambridge, Back in the 19th century, back in the uh, 1880s, uh, Leslie Stephen, father of Virginia Woolf, in an article said, we have a doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, so parliament can do what it likes. If it passed a law saying that all blue-eyed babies should be killed, then that would be the law and we would all have to obey. But the reason why we don't have such a law is that um, members of parliament are gentlemen. Well, that may have been true then, of course, it's not so clear that it is any longer. And that is why they act with restraint. And in any case, he said, nobody would dream of ordering the murder of blue-eyed babies. Well, I'm afraid he lived just 50 years before the National Socialist Party came to power in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, they enacted the equivalent of doing just that thing. John Stuart Mill, at about the same time, said, the thing that restrains our parliament is what he called constitutional morality, a sense of restraint, a sense of, of doing things in a relatively collegial and uh, consultative kind of way, respecting the right of the uh, opposition to a view and trying to act in the best interests of the country as a whole. And what we've seen in recent years and what we have now is extreme partisanship in, in politics. I mean, the, the people that now occupy Downing Street, and in, in essence, they are the Leave campaign from 2016. Dominic Cummings and others whom he's brought in, and Johnson himself, who chose to back uh, Leave for his own uh, personal career purposes. But they are, in essence, the Leave campaign, highly partisan and not listening to reason. They should, in the light of the effect on the economy of COVID-19, have uh, arranged an extension for a couple of years. But they saw, I think, that if they had done so, the likelihood of our leaving the EU at all was extremely diminished. And that's why they're going ahead with it. They're trying to drag us out uh, um, uh, without uh, uh, consideration for the double whammy, really, of COVID-19 and the effects of a, uh, of a hard or no deal Brexit. So I think we've got our numbers on our side, and I think therefore it is absolutely important that we should not accept the idea that the argument is over. We should not accept the idea that we can't get, get back into the EU and that we shouldn't work to do so. Because as I say, there is a possible route. That route is we get electoral reform, we get the reform parliament to give us another say on, on Europe. And if that were to happen, it may, and it looks very unlikely at this moment that it will happen. I'll revisit that point momentarily. But if it were to happen, then this nightmare would be of shorter duration than, uh, than we think. So let's look at the question, therefore, of the possibilities of um, uh, uh, electoral reform and the kinds of things that have to be done in order to make that and what follows it possible. Well, the good news is that um, the, all the opposition parties other than Labour have agreed to cooperate and collaborate for the next uh, general election. And they are, all of them, of course, committed to electoral reform. We see that under the new leadership of the Labour Party, there are some noises uh, to the effect that uh, electoral reform might be on the table for them. That's not a commitment which has been officially made by the Labour Party yet, but uh, Keir Starmer has, uh, has made positive noises in that respect, which is a good sign. However, the key thing is this. The Labour Party are extremely unlikely to win an outright majority in another general election, 
mainly because of the Scotland factor. They've lost Scotland and uh, they would have to win it back in very large measure in order to have a hope of having a majority in Parliament. That means that they really need, if they are going to uh, get the Conservatives out and uh, lead an administration, to do it in collaboration with uh, other opposition parties. So the essential here is to get, a, a, at least for the next election, after which everybody can go back to their tribalism if they want, but at very least for the next election, there has to be a serious collaborative effort by the opposition parties. And what would really bring them together is uh, a, a platform for electoral reform. It is key. It is also key to the future influence of, of all these parties in our polity anyway. But in order to do that properly, the Labour Party itself has to take a big, bold step. And the big, bold step is this. In the constitution of the Labour Party, there is a provision which says that they must feel the candidate in every constituency. Now, there are constituencies in which they have no chance whatever of winning and where perhaps the Liberal Democrats or the Greens, and certainly in the case of Wales or Scotland, Plaid and SNP, have a far better chance of winning. And they therefore ought, in at least this one upcoming election, they ought to suspend that clause in the Constitution and really work uh, to, together with all the other uh, opposition parties, to um, get a change of government, to get a coalition government in, and to do something about our electoral system. Let me just open a little footnote here, that reform of the electoral system tends in most people's minds to come along with the desire to reform everything, the House of Lords, the monarchy, the this, the that and the other. And that it would be a very, very bad um, strategic and tactical error to try to reform too much all in one go. One thing at a time, one focused thing at a time, and the key thing is electoral reform, other things would follow from a reformed parliament. So that, 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 that's what has to happen. Now, how do we make it happen? Well, it is we, we, the people who make this happen. It's you and me. It's writing to our, our uh, local Lib Dems and, and Labour Party people and Green Party people. It's us constantly barraging them with the demand that they do this. If they're going to act in the interests of the country as a whole, if they're going to be rational about their own future prospects, and if they really are serious in wanting to serve the, the country, they, they've really got to sit up and take notice of this. This is vital. You know, our constitution in this country, which as you know, is uncodified, made up of a patchwork of uh, some statute, some conventions and, and traditions, very well described as a set of understandings that nobody understands, which sounds like a joke, but it's no joke because it means that um, different governments can interpret it as they will. If you look back across the, the history of referendums in the United Kingdom, starting in 1972 with the first Northern Ireland referendum, you, you see that they, they have all been conducted on a different basis. Some have had a, a threshold um, requirement in them, others not. Uh, one in 2011 was uh, uh, said to be uh, mandating. N none, of them, none of the rest are, and indeed in constitutional terms they can't be given the doctrine of the sovereignty of, of parliament. If there's going to be uh, the use of referendums in a representative democracy, and there shouldn't be, because after all, we elect representatives to go and do a job of work on our behalf, get the facts, get the information, listen to argument and discussion and debate, form a judgment, act in the best interests of the country, not dodge their responsibility and put it back to people who haven't explored the, the um, uh, details of the facts and, and the likelihoods and possibilities and so on. The referendum is a dodging of, of responsibility and it produces very often uh, appalling results as alas we see. But all the referendums that have had this, this uh, different basis depending upon what seemed convenient and appropriate to whoever happened to be occupying the government of the day. This is why our constitutional arrangements themselves need to be looked at not just the electoral reform, but we also at least need to have greater clarity and consistency in some of the central arrangements of how we do things. However, the idea of codifying the constitution, that is a step too far, as I say, let's focus on one thing at a time. Let's move on to other things uh, later when the situation is clarified and matters are, are, are more stable. But it is up to us, we have to do the work. We have got to persuade the people 
You know, we can't start new political parties to do this. It's very, very difficult to get a new political party off the ground. Therefore, existing parties with some structure, with some funding, with uh, people on the ground, with party organization, they're the ones that we have to persuade. And in England, it's, uh, it's the Labour Party and it's the Lib Dems and it's the Greens. And we've got to persuade them to work together. And principally, of course, it's the Labour Party we have to persuade to do this. We've got to demand of them that they, that they step up and become really, really seriously responsible and think about what would genuinely be in the interests of the country as a whole and not just a party political ideological line and work with the other parties and get this done. It is key because if we can get that done, if we can get, if we can win an election on an electoral reform platform with a, a coalition government formed by the current uh, um, opposition parties, if we can get that reform through, then I think things look very different and we can think seriously again uh, about the EU question. So that's important. Allied to this, uh, this endeavor is something that, that uh, um, I think uh, of, of considerable importance also. And that is the following fact, that with an 80 seat majority in the House of Commons, Parliament is effectively dead. We have a little bit of theater on, uh, you know, Prime Minister's questions, and we see Keir Starmer performing as a very accomplished lawyer um, at the moment. We see, you know, uh, some SMP or some uh, uh, other Labour Party people making impassioned speeches, but of course it has no effect with a, a huge majority for the government. So Parliament is a rubber stamping mechanism for the government in the House of Commons is at any rate, is a rubber stamping mechanism for the government. And there is very little that anybody can do about um, the, 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 the government's uh, endeavors. This means that democratic action, it's a zombie parliament, okay? So democratic action has to be outside parliament. Again, it has to be us. Now I know, because I, I share this with, I think, the vast majority of uh, fellow citizens, that you know, getting engaged in, in politics and campaigning and writing letters and giving speeches and all that is tiring and tiresome. We've all got our families and our jobs, our careers. We just want to be getting on with the things that we're interested in. And we don't want to have to be looking over our shoulder all the time at the government and the political situation, which is why we want responsible government in our country that will quietly and, and honestly get on with the job of acting in everybody's interests. That's what we want. But I'm afraid that is not the situation at the moment. And I'm afraid that there is just nothing that is going to come out of Whitehall and Westminster uh, which uh, those of us on this side of the argument about Europe in particular are going to be very happy about. And indeed, uh, we may not be very happy about a number of other things as well. So I'm afraid this is a, a moment where we do have to step up. I'm keen on the idea of citizens' assemblies. And the minute that you mention those two words, citizens' assemblies, you get people starting to suck their teeth and say, oh dear, well, that takes a huge amount of organization, takes a lot of money. Um, you know, how are we going to do it? Well, the, the formal attempt to um, set up uh, citizens' assembly type institutions, together with the amount of funding, a large amount of funding that that would require, is something which is at a very, very early stage of, of being worked on. So there are a, a number of people, and, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, part of it also, who are thinking about how we might do this in a more formal way. You know, when you think of a citizens' assembly, you think of, of um, people in a local area or region getting together uh, on a nonpartisan basis, with lots of civil society organizations uh, represented there, um, having an opportunity to put forward uh, ideas, to discuss what's happening in the country, to agree to send resolutions to, to parliament, but at any rate, to be a focus for uh, democratic expression and activity outside Parliament when we cannot rely on Parliament to be that place. Again, a footnote remark. If you look at the two years between um, 2017 and uh, the general election of 2019, when we had what was called a hung Parliament, and the reflex view about a hung Parliament is that that's a bad thing because you can't get anything done. In fact, in those two years, we saw Parliament doing what Parliament should do. We saw parliamentarians making a difference to what was happening. We saw the government having to uh, get through its uh, program 
piece by piece on the merits of each piece by itself, not just uh, on the basis of the whips, not just using Parliament as a rubber stamp because you've got a, a majority there, but actually having to work for each step of what they did. That's what Parliament should be like. That is one of the wonderful things that will come from proportional representation is that you will have coalition governments and a much, much more diverse parliament where everything has to go through on its merits if it is going to go through. And then you can rely on parliament uh, as a place where there will be genuine debate and real differences made. But while that is not the case, I think it's up to us. So, okay, so citizens assemblies would take a, a lot of organization, a lot of money, but we don't have to wait for somebody to come up with the, the framework and to come up with the funding. We can do it informally. We can bring together people. We brought together, I don't know how many uh, people are together on this call now, uh, but we can bring people together. We can discuss ideas, raise them, encourage one another, inform one another. Uh, and and we, can, we can try to get to uh, revive you know, local um, uh, journalism uh, to cover those uh, discussions and those meetings and to be more active on their behalf as well. And if this were happening all around the country, if we could persuade people, to, to get a bit of a buzz going, then that will provide leverage for persuading the Labour Party and the other opposition parties to do this very vital thing, which is to have a joint platform for electoral reform for the next uh, uh, general election. I also think, by the way, that uh, um, you, can, you, you could uh, respect the argument which says, look, let's, let's not let on that we want electoral reform so that we can get back into the EU. I mean, I think it would be a very natural consequence of electoral reform that we would have another say on EU membership. That will look after itself. But quite independently of that, it is utterly unacceptable that we have governments with 100% of the power on minorities of electoral, uh, of electorate support in this country. It's just simply not acceptable. And it has led us uh, into the situation we're in at the moment because people who didn't or don't have the kind of constitutional morality type of restraint that our 19th century forebears were talking about can see the opportunities. Let me remind you of something. Again, this is something you, you've probably heard uh, often enough, but we all know that um, elections and referendums uh, are won on, on and lost on, on very small margins, especially uh, when we have a first-past-the-post system that we've got now. The first-past-the-post system that we have now is profoundly undemocratic, very easy to prove that. Think of a constituency with 100 voters in it, in which 10 different parties stand. Suppose eight of those uh, candidates get 10 votes each, one gets nine votes and the last gets 11 votes. And it's the person with 11 votes who goes to parliament on the first past the post system. The other 89 voters being wholly unrepresented. Indeed in our parliament today, the majority of the electorate, uh, uh, only 29% voted for the conservatives. So the vast majority of the electorate are not represented in parliament uh, and can have no effect on the outcome of legislation there. This is un just unacceptable. But it's very, very easy to hack that system. And it, it's done by uh, applying money to persuading that small group. You know, you've got two groups of people, they're going to vote this way or that way in a two party system, which is what First Past the Post produces, or in a referendum. And they've made up their minds and they've made up their minds, but it's the people in the middle who will swing it. Just, just a small group of people. Back in 2016, it was a tiny little group of people who if you could persuade them, if you could use social media to target them with messaging that nobody else saw, so the messaging couldn't be challenged or called out if it was false, as much of it was, then you could just swing the vote. It happened in the United States with the election of Trump, happened in the referendum here, and no doubt happened in the two elections we've had since the referendum. So this is not, not acceptable, and it is the, it's the big lesson that we've learned from the debacle of Brexit, of what happened that has been uh, dragging us out uh, of, of the EU. So that is what I urge. I urge us to get involved, argue, campaign, to get the opposition parties to form a joint platform to reform our electoral system, because I think what follows from that is the Sunday Uplands. 
All right, now let me just say um, something very briefly about the Russia report. Now I have to tell you that I thought the uh, Russia report was going to be much less dramatic than it has turned out to be. I thought it would be much more heavily redacted and much more equivocal, that we wouldn't, it wouldn't really say things so clearly and, and emphatically as it has done. And, the, and the, the real killer in this is that the um, Committee of, of uh, Parliament that looks at security issues demanded of the government uh, back in 2016 and in 2017, when it had been looking at the situation uh, relating to the referendum, it demanded of the government that it inquire into the question of foreign interference in the referendum. And the government refused outright. And I think this is a serious, serious point. What we've seen in recent months is that there can be scandals. So, you know, Boris Johnson could be involved in a scandal about misusing public funds and giving £100,000 to his then mistress and getting her onto uh, jet flights to, um, you know, commercial meetings when he was mayor of London. Uh, he can, uh, he, he can, uh, tell, you know, outright porkies in Parliament and, and elsewhere. Uh, Cummings can be in direct violation of the uh, advice, the requirement uh, about um, isolating in the case of the COVID-19 uh, lockdown measures. Uh, and they, they, this is just ignored. They just carry on as normal. Well, are they going to carry on as normal? Now, the Russia report has come out and has in effect says that the last two elections and the 2016 referendum are unsafe. That there is a serious question about whether or not our system has been um, interfered with by foreign money. The evidence is piling up. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist type of person. I don't like conspiracy theories, and I feel very leery about them. And for a long time, all this stuff about Dominic Cummings spending three years in Russia as he did, and all the money which is poured into the Conservative Party from uh, Russian oligarchs, uh, millions of pounds, uh, it seems, um, and Boris Johnson spending time at, uh, you know, country houses of, of, of these folk. All, all, all of it looks and smells like a conspiracy theory. But alas, uh, you know, it is now beginning to mount up in, in such a way that it makes one feel that one cannot uh, ignore if not that, then one certainly cannot ignore the Russia report itself and the things that it says. In almost in terms, almost in, in terms, the Russia report says there is a problem here. There is a serious problem. Our system has been seriously interfered with. Now, this is not something that can just be left to float away in the backstream, like the Arcuri misuse of public funds, or like the misinformation and lies, or like the Cummings matter. You can't just, just let it slip off like water off duff, duck's back of Boris Johnson and this government. This is something that we mustn't let go. We've got to insist that this kind of thing is simply not acceptable. When you look at the contrast between how we felt about our country and our standing in the world and, and, and you know, the, the kind of sense of honor that we expected people to have and by which we expected them to behave, just as recently as the wonderful year of the Olympics in 2012. And we look at the situation that we're in now, the appalling embarrassment of, of living in a country which is doing so much harm to itself, which has such you know, dysfunctional government and, and a, a person like Boris Johnson at its head. Well, I mean, it's as, every bit as embarrassing as it must be for Americans with Trump in the White House. And this is not acceptable. We're better than this. We should be better than this. And we should argue that things have got to be put right. So that's another thing that uh, um, our, our uh, citizens' activism should uh, involve. I'm going to end on that point. I, I just mentioned to you that um, in, uh, on my own personal website, which is just uh, AC Grading, all one word, acgrading.com, there is a, an article by me called Putney. It's a hashtag Putney, which is a reference to the Putney debates back in 1647, when the people, the uh, uh, new model army soldiers, have put forward some suggestions about constitutional reform in the middle of the uh, Civil War. 
and I set out in there some of the points that I've made this evening, but also some of the suggestions I make about things that we can do. The two chief being working for getting the opposition parties to work for electoral reform and citizens activism, citizens discussion or citizens assemblies, informal or otherwise, uh, because the fact that parliament is zombie. But I also point out there that, you know, if things become too intolerable, if we simply cannot accept the way the government is comporting itself and what they're doing to our country and, and the danger that they pose to tens of, if not hundreds of thousands uh, of, of jobs by not getting a, a decent deal with the European Union uh, for the next few years, then we may have to consider what else we can do as citizens, um, more or less hijacked by a, a government that is acting in ways that seem to be directly contrary to our interests. I could refer you to uh, wonderful passages in John Locke on, um, on uh, the treatises of, on government about uh, what happens when uh, a government is no longer acting in the interests of a, of a country. Uh, perhaps things haven't got quite to that point yet, but you know we have to bear in mind the fact that this is our country, this is the future of ourselves and our young people, that this is an unacceptably terrible mistake that has been made in our country and that we, we here now today, are the people who have to try and do something to put it right. So we shouldn't accept that Brexit is going to be a, a long-term thing. We should work very hard to create the circumstances in which we can return to become one of the leading nations uh, in Europe, um, promoting all the better things, there are a lot of problems with Europe, there's no question, it needs to reform itself, but there are a lot of very good things about it, including the fact that it is a great peace project, it's very progressive, uh, and it is something that provides huge opportunities for all of us. So Paul, I'll leave it then, and uh, I'm sure there are questions and, and comments. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, that was very, very interesting. I think there'll be quite a lot of questions now, um, but I'll hand over to Jackie, who um, will start going through them. She's unmuted. Um, I think there might be a problem with her mic, actually. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, just let me get some questions here. Um, I think actually there's one question which, which actually follows on from that, from Rachel Dries. Dale, Dale. Um, which was, let me get that question. Um, Canvassing them, Paul, I can see a question from Rachel Drysdale about uh, alternative scenarios. That, that was what I was looking for, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so the, the point that uh, Rachel makes, if I, if I may say, Rachel, um, is that uh, electoral reform can't happen at the, um, until the next general election or after the next general election at the very soonest. What can we do until then? Because Brexit, uh, the full Brexit is happening at the end of this year. Well, the, 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 this is true. Now, um, you know, we are uh, in a situation where we are being dragged, as it seems, helplessly along by an incompetent and highly doctrinaire government, which is, looks as if it's been working towards getting a no deal crash out. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, e even all those businesses which were forced to sign um, NDAs by, by the government, so they didn't comment on, on what was happening over the last few years about Brexit, and now getting such cold feet about the prospects of what will happen if we don't have any kind of a deal, and um, for example, the, the haulage industry, that they are beginning to speak out. In the coming four months, uh, th therefore, we're going to see quite a lot of turbulence uh, and uh, we now know that the EU is not going to blink on this one. Why should they? I mean, there are 27 countries with a you know, great uh, um, network and fabric of agreements, a level playing field, which they expect anybody who trades with them to respect and, and observe. Um, so we may very well see this uh, lot in, in Downing Street be the ones uh, who buckle. We can hope so, because otherwise I think there will be serious problems. But whatever's going to happen, whatever's going to happen, there is going to be a lot of unemployment um, coming on stream. And this is, uh, I, this is something that I find incredibly concerning because when we just talk numbers, we forget that each individual unemployed person is a life, may even be a family affected by it. That in a community where there is a 
a significant degree of unemployment. Things like local shops shut down and the local cafe and, and uh, the, the high street begins to board up. And it's just awful for communities as it is for individuals to be thrown out of work. And frankly, any government that does something that it knows is going to increase unemployment is a government which is uh, uh, acting uh, uh, you know, malevolently in my view and this government is doing precisely that. But there's not a huge amount that we can do immediately other than set in motion the most emphatic movement towards uh, electoral reform because that is where our great hope lies. And you have to remember this, the next election is not very far away. No, no government, no parliament is going to last the full five year term. A government is going to try to look for an opportunity somewhere in the late in the third year or the fourth year to do it. We're already getting on towards uh, um, the December of, of this year. So it could be two or three years that we've got to so organize opposition that we can win a, a next election uh, on, on an electoral reform basis. That's not very long in fact. And it also not very long from December of this year when we, if we do crash out of the EU, because things won't have changed that much over the next three to five years, that if we do manage to uh, that early get back uh, into the EU, we talk to our EU friends about getting back in, we're not going to have the wonderful deal that we did have. But personally, that doesn't worry me too much. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it, it could be as early as that. So th th this is not, uh, you know, this is not a far distant invisible hope. It is a real thing that we ought to be doing and we ought to be doing it right now. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I've got a question from Maddie Bell here, which was, um, is there any chance that the contents of the Russia report can be used to invalidate the referendum result? Well, I, I know that there are some legal um, eagles who, who are looking at that. Uh, th th it's not impossible, um, so there may very well be uh, perhaps a, uh, a legal challenge or a judicial review. Um, so I do know various people who are thinking about it because we don't want to miss a trick at all. Uh, and um, I guess it's a matter of watching the space. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm sorry, this is going to dot around slightly, but Anne Copley's asked, um, an interesting question about whether there's any chance that we can harness some of the energies that have been seen around COVID-19, such as mutual aid groups, in terms of campaigning on um, uh, EU membership or indeed electoral reform. Yes, very, very, very much so. I mean, across a whole range of things, COVID-19 is making a difference to the way we live, the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we conduct uh, social activism. It's making a huge amount of difference in, in a lot of respects. We're all learning a lot of new things. We're learning that this kind of format, for example, is a pretty effective way of getting people um, together because you know, it cuts down travel time and pollution and, and, and so forth. So th there are lots of ways that, that we could um, benefit from this. And the, the way that groups of people are coming together to um, help one another through the COVID crisis could be a model and should be a model really for thinking about how we can work together across party lines, across community lines, to um, really make a difference, uh, both on the electoral front, on the political front, but also eventually on the European front. Because by the way, um, the argument about Europe and why we should be in Europe is not just an economic argument, although it's an incredibly important aspect of it, but I think keeping people conscious of what it is that we're losing across a whole range is very important. And this is a very good medium for getting that message across. Thank you. Um, again, sorry, with apologies for dotting about slightly, but um, Mike Lloyd has asked about the sort of other side of the coin in terms of EU reform. Does the EU itself need to reform um, in order to prevent further exits, in order to um, become fit for purpose in the modern era? Oh, yes, so there's no question about it. Uh, and I mean, one good thing um, to note is that, that there are some very good people both uh, in, in European politics, um, so thinking of Council of Ministers side of things, but in the, in the Commission, which is the EU civil service, and in Parliament. So um, I've had uh, the, uh, the pleasure of getting to know Guy Verhofstadt, who is the leader of a, a sort of large uh, sort of Lib Dem kind of uh, wing in, in, um, 
in, in the European Parliament, very keen on various kinds of reform, including being a bit tougher on people like Orban in Hungary and, and, the, uh, and the Poles, who are not really matching up to the kinds of expectations and standards that the EU wants to set itself. Um, so, you know, it's Im important that it should cease to be in, in, in one way, um, quite so concessive on things to do with human rights and, and, and political liberties. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I admire the way that the EU has always been very careful, very scrupulous um, about not impinging on member states' sovereignty, uh, being very gradualist in its approach to those aspects of cooperation where greater uh, cooperation is required, um, especially on the economic front. Uh, and the anomalies and, and distortions that there are in the EU are in fact a sort of function of the fact that when you are moving towards something, you set yourself a target five or ten years uh, ahead, the world changes during the course of those five and ten years, and so the target has to be moved even further ahead. You've got to be constantly working at the right kinds of, of reforms, um, the right kinds of goals, to make the thing flourish. But as a work in progress, it is a very good work, in my view. Um, maybe slightly related to that, um, Eric Borg just picked up on the fact that you've talked about electoral reform, um, but noted that there are actually many different ways that uh, proportional systems are instantiated in different places in terms of things like um, thresholds for representation. Mm -hmm. So the question really is, is, can you give a bit more specificity in terms of the particular system that yeah. you are pointing towards? Indeed. So there are a number of different uh, uh, systems and some of them are very bad. I mean, some of them result in the kind of situation you get in Italy and in Israel, where very, very, very small parties uh, are the tail that uh, wag the whole dog. And, and, and that's very bad. Um, of, of all, the, no system is perfect, but uh, pretty well all of them are much less imperfect than the first past the post system, that's for sure. But probably the best of them is the single transferable vote. Or you could also consider a model like the New Zealand model, which is the mixed membership uh, model. Personally, the, the SDV, single transferable vote, seems better to me. The question of a, of a threshold above what percentage of a vote should representation occur and how happy should we be about letting minority parties in? I mean, people point out that if we had a PR system, then the Brexit party would be in Parliament. Now, I say to that, I say that that would be a very good thing. All you have to do is just think of how the Brexit Party comported itself in the European Parliament for the few months of, of uh, last year, and uh, see what fools they made of themselves, and hear their arguments uh, out there on the public platform, rather than having them outside the, the mainstream, festering, as it were, under the skin of, of society. Have them there in Parliament, and let's see them at work, and let's hear what they have to say. And, and let them vent, by the way, because if they have seats in Parliament, then in fact they are much less dangerous than, the, than if they are extra parliamentary. So uh, it doesn't worry me to think that you will get small extremist groups uh, in, in Parliament. Um, the, the much, much greater danger is that you get a small extremist group in Parliament in our current system, which can control Parliament. This is the ERG, this is the Eurosceptics. They captured the uh, power in, in, uh, in, in the party which has captured the majority in Parliament, and their agenda is the one that is dragging the entire country against its majority will in a direction that the majority don't want to go in. So that's a much greater danger. Thanks. And a related question from um, Ulrich Klosek, who's um, sort of expressed the concern that in the light of the, the 2011 referendum on electoral reform, that the appetite for electoral reform might simply be quite low and that this might not be the issue on which to try for a, a united cross-party platform? Uh, well, there are two things to be said about that. It's a good point to raise, an important point to raise. The first thing to say about it is that the 2011 referendum on electoral reform is an absolute model case of how not to have a, a, a referendum, or rather, how to have a referendum which you do not want the, the outcome of to go against your own wishes. The conservative, major, the, cons, the conservative partners in the coalition at the time were dead against uh, electoral reform, and they made jolly sure that uh, the, the, the referendum wasn't going to give that result. 
Moreover, the system that the Liberal Democrats then uh, were offering is, is a, a very bad system. It's a, it's a bad system. It's not even really all that proportional uh, a system. So that's point number one. Point number two is, I think the world has changed dramatically. I think that the realization that uh, our current electoral system is extremely dysfunctional and distorting is starting to come home. And it is up to us to make that case. It's up to us to put the argument. It's up to us to point out to people that, that what, what's happening here is, a, is a, a, a very small minority of the people have empowered those who are doing what they will against the interests of the rest of us. And that is an argument which now seems to me to be a very easy one to win, but it has to be put. But it's a new world, it's a different situation here, and I think that uh, the time has come. Proportional representation is finding its time. Thank you, thank you. Um, and an interesting question from um, Miriam Leonard, I think, asking sort of A, to what extent do you know the uh, pan-European institutions which will continue to be a part of? And how can we foster our position within them, thinking particularly perhaps of the, of the European Commission on of Human Rights? Well, uh, I don't know, uh, to, to be frank, uh, exactly what the landscape is going to look like uh, after 31st of December this year. Uh, naturally enough, there are lots of respects, um, like, for example, science, like the ECHR, and a number of them that we would very much like to remain part of. In fact, the ECHR is not even part of the EU. It's, it's a, a Council of Europe thing, and it predates uh, the EEC and the EU. So I'm very much hoping that that, that will continue. But the uh, um, auguries are not particularly good because there's all this talk about um, revoking the Human Rights Act and putting you know, a, a new Bill of Rights uh, in place. Uh, and I think that there's a battle to be fought over that one. But I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question because it's all in flux at the moment. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of different interest groups which are hoping that we are still going to be able to be part of things, part of Erasmus, you know, access to uh, research funding in Europe and so forth. Uh, but the, in, in none of those cases is the augury very good either. Thanks. Um, I'll try and combine a couple of questions um, together. What, something from uh, Mark Lahn and, and something from Hugo Tyson. So I hope I do justice to what um, Hugo and Mark have asked. But essentially, they're questions which are um, about the, the likelihood that Brexiteers will continue to blame the EU or the structure of any deal that, that we do manage to achieve um, with the EU for all of our problems into the into the long-term future? And, and how can we best try and position ourselves in relation to that and rebut that? Well, I, I mean, the answer to that is, of course they will. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that is their one resource now, you know. And now that they own this and they are wholly responsible for it, nevertheless, of course they're going to try and shift the blame. They're doing it already with COVID, you know, shifting the blame for the um, sort of decimation of, of uh, uh, care home uh, um, uh, our occupants uh, onto the care homes themselves and so forth. And of course, they will try to shift the blame. And we must call them out on it. We just simply mustn't let them do it. We've got to use every tool at our disposal to do that. And of course, the main tool is uh, social media. Let me just say one thing about social media. Social media has turned out to be the most poisonous and destructive thing you could possibly imagine. Uh, I mean, it has been used to um, manipulate our, our system. Uh, it, it is just a, a horrible uh, zone where anonymous people troll and blog and say ghastly things uh, about other people and issue threats and so forth. But it is also uh, a resource. It's also something that we can make use of uh, in, in order to get our message across and in order to call people out and challenge them. Uh, and e even though what tends to happen is that we all fall into a, a bubble and we you know, tweet one another and Facebook one another, uh, and give one another comfort and, and support. Um, still, it, it, it's, it's possible to break into those bubbles, into other people's bubbles, and to call people out and, and to challenge them. So we've got to keep doing that. But if we, we also do it, and I think you see, just because of the nature of the social, various social media domains, they tend to be discounted to, to some extent because, you know, people rant and rave and say things and and, and promulgate uh, falsehoods on them. And so they tend to get slightly less treated with less seriousness than they should be. But if there is citizen activism, if there, is, if there are informal citizens assemblies, if you've got things together and mobilized local 
uh, press uh, and had media platforms that reflect or express what those citizens groups are doing and saying, that can, can have more leverage, that can have more of an effect. Because I remember many, many years ago being told by a very senior civil servant that uh, if um, her minister received a dozen letters of complaint about a certain matter, that it really worried him because he thought that each such letter was the tip of an iceberg and that, that and it re represented in some way a kind of groundswell of opinion. Well, now that everybody can publish their opinion on the internet and on social media, that, that, that now has a slightly less force, unless it comes from something which is a bit more organized, like a local citizens group. So that is why I say, even informal citizens assemblies, putting forward ideas, uh, making suggestions, picking up on or challenging things, can have a, 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 a really serious effect. Thanks. Uh, had a sort of related question, I think, from John Turner, who's asked whether people need to feel the pain of Brexit in order for minds to be changed. Well, um, uh, you know, there, there is an argument which says uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and I think uh, from Mr. Turner's point of view, the happy news is that that pain is going to be felt one way or another. We don't even have to sit back and wait for it to happen. There will be pain, alas. Um, and it's a sad thing, especially for people who are either you know caught between the two sides of this argument or who thought genuinely thought that they were being told the truth when they were told that the eu was a bad thing and so on so it, it is sad for them but uh, on the other hand if i were to, to choose between staying as close as possible to eu conditions and requirements so that the acquis still apply making it much easier to get back in in a few years time than diverging dramatically and really having a disastrous uh, economic impact. I think I would prefer to go with the earlier. So it may be that we, we get the best of both worlds. So in other words, we get the economic impact that will hurt, but at the same time that not too much time will elapse for us to diverge too far from the EU. Mm. Well, on, on that question of, of time, really, um, Sean Klein has asked uh, what you think of the prospects for the UK staying together, or perhaps I should say breaking up, um, and particularly yeah. the chance of the UK breaking up before a return to Europe or before the um, potential to obtain electoral reform might occur. Well, do you know what? I, I think the chances of the UK breaking up are now the greatest they have ever been for many, many centuries. Uh, and I think it's a, a, a real serious possibility. There's now a majority in favour of um, independence in, in Scotland, um, and, and that's new. I mean, the Scottish independence movement has fought against the fact that it, it, really far too many people with their memories of the tremendous Scottish contribution to uh, the empire, uh, you know, it was built and run really by, by the Scots and Scottish engineers and so forth. That, but but I think all, all that is now washed away uh, in, in the awful truth that the Scots are facing, which is that they have been dragged hither and thither against their interests by, uh, by the English. And uh, sentiment has changed there, I think. So I do think that um, after the next uh, um, election in, in Scotland, if the SNP get a, an increased majority or a strong majority, the impulse to another referendum will be irresistible. They may even decide to try to run one on a kind of UDI basis if things begin to look too bad. Um, but uh, th there is a threat that there are people talking about a Celtic Union, Wales and the whole of Ireland and, and Scotland joining together. Personally, my own sort of personal uh, feeling now is, and, and I was a, a unionist, not, not, not a conservative <laughs> unionist, but, uh, but a believer in the union with Scotland, because I'm, I'm half English, quarter Scot and quarter Welsh. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a union in myself genetically. Uh, and when this referendum was held in 2014 on Scottish independence, I was one of those people who went and put a stone uh, in the can on the border between England and Scotland as a kind of belt buckle to keep the two countries together. I'm now in favour of, of Scottish independence because I, I, I really think that it's you know, no longer sustainable really for them to be dragged hither and thither by what happens just in England. But so what I would really, really like to see is all the constituents, uh, all the parts of, the, of the, all the, the nations in the Western islands of Europe, 
the British Isles, all of them in the EU together. But uh, you know, each of them ha having the kind of regional autonomy, the, uh, the uh, um, subsidiarity that uh, nations and regions enjoy in the, in the EU setup. That I think would be a, a kind of an ideal because it would be the same thing as being together, but it would be a much greater self-determination for the, for the various nations. Thanks. Um, Marilyn Zonconato's asked if uh, a campaign in relation to a, a US free trade agreement ought to be our, our current priority or our main current priority. A US free trade agreement, is that? Yes, a US free trade agreement. Um, well, so campaigning against, I think we're talking about, oh, campaign against, against, against yeah, provisions yeah. of. Uh, well, I, I emphatically, yes, if Trump were to w win another term, because I think that would be absolutely disastrous for us less so uh, than if uh, Biden gets in. Um, but uh, the, the United States of America is quite frankly not going to be that interested in a small country with a modest uh, sized economy uh, and it's not going to make concessions. Uh, it's got its own interests to pursue and it will pursue them. And we know that uh, standards, especially in foodstuffs in, in the United States, are uh, appalling. And we don't really want to be part of that at all. I mean, one of the very few heartening things that has happened recently is the major supermarkets here saying they will not stock chlorinated uh, chicken or, or one or two other things um, that, that might come out of the US. So to some extent, it does depend on what happens in November in the US election. But yes, uh, I, I think we should uh, be campaigning to be as aligned as possible with the EU and as little aligned as possible with the US and, and China. Because if we are, we, we, we become, you know, their playthings, we become victims of their internal politics. Uh, and that would be a bad thing for us. Thank you. Um, Paul, I, I don't know how we're doing for time. I know you had a question yourself. Yeah, well, it was, it was more of a follow into that. I was just wondering, um, what it's a relation to the US trade deal uh, and the fact it was abandoned, as announced this morning, actually, that they're ab abandoning that, those talks and negotiations for now. Um, there has been quite a large pushback on food standards. We saw actually one of the first rebellions of, of Tory MPs and also the NHS um, with the COVID-19, it has become even more celebrated. You, there's, you know, and you can... I just wonder to what extent the government has realised that it can only push people so far and how that is actually kind of encouraging in a sense that even this government with an 80 seat majority and knows that it can only, there are, it, there are limits to, to what it can do and, and maybe we should just, do you think we should fo focus on really on several kind of wedge issues like this where you can really get traction in the general public and use them then to, to drive the, our, you know, to further our wider goals of avoiding dodgy trade deals with the US and, and forming a, a closer relationship with the, with the EU. Well, that's a very astute point uh, on your part there, um, Paul, because what you've noticed is that a very small lobby has turned out to, to have quite a lot of, of leverage. And this is the farmers lobby, the agriculture lobby. And they have made a difference. I, I'm just wondering, you know, how many dots there are to connect up between what the farmers have been saying uh, in the last uh, four, six weeks uh, and, and what happened today. Um, because, you know, even, even though the, the, the farmers in the shires, in the Tory shires, uh, are, if they all stop voting Tory, we're not going to make a difference to the outcome there, that their voice is one that uh, tends to be listened to by, by um, Shire MPs. Uh, and that is an example of how a small lobby, a small well-focused lobby, if it goes about it in the right kind of way, can have an impact. And, and therefore it gives heart to uh, all those groups who have a special interest. I mean, you, for example, might have a special interest in science research funding and want to try and get a campaign going on that. And there are some very influential people and some very influential institutions in the country through which that can be done. And there will be people on, on this call with an interest in other things, like for example, the human rights side of things, the civil liberties side of things, um, uh, censorship in, in, in newspapers, the behavior of the press, uh, all, all those considerations. There's every reason to 
set up, conduct and pursue campaigns of, of a particular focused kind like that, because they can make a difference. And jointly, by the way, they can make an even, there can be a kind of multiplier effect. It can be an even bigger difference because people start waking up and seeing, you know, we can't just trash the whole arrangement that we've had this, with this enormous market uh, and, and expect that we're going to survive. Thank you. Um, how, how are we doing for time? Are we okay to continue with a couple more questions? Let's take a couple more questions and then we'll let everybody get back to their glasses of wine. Right. I've got, um, Peter, probably having them already, I shouldn't <laughs> um, Peter French has asked to ask his own question. Um, I'll ask him to be unmuted. I think you, Paul, will need to actually do the unmuting. Um, so if you could look at that, Paul, for Peter French. And in the meantime, I'll ask a question from um, Daniel Arthur, who's asked um, in relation to some of the comments you made previously, Anthony, about um, Poland and Hungary. Whether there were, whether there are um, problematic tensions between the desire to make sure we're enforcing um, uh, some of the rule of law considerations on countries like Poland and Hungary and their own democratic choices. Yes, uh, uh, you know th there are these tensions. I mean, what, what what one thing has one has to remember is that nothing is perfect. No institution is perfect, and we can't. Um, expect the EU to be able to get everything right all the time across the whole board, uh, which is one reason why it, it has been quite, actually quite frustrating for some people in the European Parliament and in the Commission. It, it's been rather careful about how it's approached Hungary and Poland, uh, precisely for this, this reason, you know, internal political autonomy and the choices that people are making and the kinds of standards that the EU wants to set. But there are mechanisms, there are provisions uh, in the EU treaties and, and arrangements which are such that uh, if anyone were to go too far, and what's noticeable about both Poland and Hungary is that they themselves have been a bit careful about not going absolutely over the line, um, there will be sanctions that the EU can uh, impose, right up to suspending membership and with it all the benefits that uh, membership brings along. So it's a difficult balance, it's a difficult negotiation, but you know any any uh, community, whether it's a small local community in Cambridge or it's, a, it's, it's the European Union uh, community as a whole, has to have this constant negotiation with itself, this constant sense of dealing with all the bubbles of imperfection that, that are constantly coming up, uh, and that is just a fact of life. Thank you. Do, do we have Peter? If we don't, then perhaps Peter will forgive me if, I'll, if I read his question. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a rousing one to finish with, perhaps. Um, so Peter says, there is a growing unrest in the country sector by sector as anger is growing, which will be fed by the numbers of unemployed growing throughout the summer. This could build with the Scotland situation into a possible poll tax moment for Boris Johnson that could prove to bring Johnson down. What does Anthony think of this as a possible scenario? A rising of the people, question mark. A revolution, question mark. Well, uh, I mean, just as, as a uh, entirely a, a matter of personal preference, uh, uh, I would say, um, bring it on. <laughs> I, would <laughs> like to, I would like to see it happen. <laughs> but but uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the best way is to try to do this in, in, a, in a constitutionally uh, and democratically respectable way, to do it rationally, to do it with argument, to do it with you know, proper sort of people power, not, not getting out there on the street with um, pitchforks and so on. Uh, even though there are more mornings than not when I wake up wishing that I had the pitchfork in my hand <laughs> because it is so distressing. I mean, we really are in an awful situation. Uh, and Peter is right, you know, there is an enormous amount of anger out there. It is growing. What we need to do is we need to challenge it in very, very constructive ways, because as I said at the beginning, and as I wish to repeat, there really is a, a, a possible route through this idea of electoral reform, through getting the opposition parties to work together through the next election, which will be in the next you know, three years time. There is a genuine route here and we should work hard for it because anything which is possible can be made actual. 
let's do it this way. Let, let, let's do, let's try and do it in a peaceful way. And if that it doesn't work, well then, Peter, I'll start <laughs> my pitchfork and I'll see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, okay, well, apologies if I've missed anybody's question and for those people um, that I didn't get to, but Paul, do you want to say a few words to finish with? Yeah, well, I'd just like to thank um, Professor Grayling and Anthony Grayling for, for speaking with us tonight. I think it was quite inspirational and it covered a, a very wide range of topics in a very short time. So.